Good evening, everyone. This virtual seminar has as its themes the many questions, voices, and symbols that come to the fore when we ask about Catholicism and gender. I launched right into it. My name is Nancy Dallavalley, and I am the director of the Center for Catholic Studies at Fairfield University. Tonight, we are launching a new partnership between the Center and Commonweal Magazine, an innovative three event series called Commonweal in Conversation. We all know that this issue is currently contested. People have a lot of opinions about it, and I hope we hear many of them. It's emerged as kind of a crisis for many in the pews. It's a rallying point for others. And for younger people in the church, it's often a deal breaker and a reason to walk away. In this new series on contemporary questions, important voices from Commonweal Magazine will join thinkers from across the Catholic landscape to chart potential pathways forward. These hour-long web events will be live streamed and archived for reference on the Catholic Studies website. The address for that website is fairfield.edu slash cs, fairfield.edu slash cs. This series itself is offered as part of an academic course on Catholicism and gender at Fairfield University. And so I'm doing a little shout out to hello RS2336. I know you're out there. <laughs> I look forward to making this an annual spring event, always with this course. I do have a housekeeping note. There is a Q&A button. It might be at the bottom of your screen, or perhaps it will show up when you touch the top of your screen. Please feel free to post a question in that pop-up Q&A screen at any point during the presentation. You won't be on screen. You won't be interrupting anything. You will just put it there, it'll be archived, and I will be able to scroll through those questions when we get to the Q&A period, and I will ask as many of them as I can. But tonight. Tonight, we are honored to be kicking off this joint venture with two key voices from Commonweal. Ellen Connick, the Executive Director of Commonweal, and Molly Wilson O'Reilly, an editor-at-large and frequent contributor to the magazine. As they open our conversation tonight, they will be simply speaking from their own experience with us, sharing with us what we have titled, What We Hear When Catholics Talk About Gender. Our first presenter tonight will be Ellen Connick, Commonweal's Executive Director. Ellen. Hi, like Nancy said, first of all, thank you. Um, I'm so pleased to be here. And um, my name is Ellen. I'm the Executive Director at Commonweal. Um, which has for a hundred years, in fact, we were founded in 1924 and now here we are in 2024, um, has for a hundred years tried to create space to parse the theological, the political and the cultural questions of our day from a Catholic lens. I mentioned our magazine's endeavor, this attempt to make space and to host forums for wide open conversations because I think the topic of these seminars and this course Hi to Nancy's students. Um, this question of how the church talks about gender strikes me as theological, political, and cultural. There are many ways to ask this question and probably even more ways to answer it. So I'll try answering the question by, re by relying a little bit on the theological, the political, and the cultural elements. But fundamentally, I'll be tying these perspectives together by relying on my own experience. So theologically, I grew up in the church of the 90s and 2000s where youth ministers emphasized the importance of purity and sacrifice. I internalized these messages almost unwittingly. My Catholic high school bringing in speakers like Jason Everett to talk about saving yourself for marriage and praying for your future spouse. I attended Catholic conferences in my youth and young adulthood that said in not so subtle terms that the most um, the, the most laudable women in the church were either virgins or martyrs, or ideally both. And that even being as intelligent as someone like Edith Stein or Therese of Lisieux might be missed if one were not also a virgin or martyr. When I studied theology and philosophy in undergrad, I wrote my senior thesis on the role of women in the church, trying to name for myself the flattening effect of two stereotypes that seemed to, to define many biblical women. All seemed seemingly cast as either Eve types or Mary types, either sexually scandalous, causing the downfall of humankind as we know it, 
or like Mary, essentially sexless and thus propping up the human race through personal purity. Now, neither of those things are true of Mary or Eve in a basic way, but as a young woman, those were the messages I received most clearly. This is what I was noticing about the way the church talked about my gender. I heard that women, in particular, were to be defined by their participation or not in an essentially private act. So this was a season, and to be honest, this season may still be upon us, but I don't know trends in youth ministry now that I am not a youth. <laughs> um, this was a, a season when complementarity was all the rage. What is complementarity? Well, Molly will do um, perhaps a more sophisticated job telling you a little bit about what complementarity is, but here's my version. It's church speak, championed by Pope John Paul II's Theology of the Body, and it's a theory that suggests there's a biological and a theological precedent for heteronormativity. It advances a kind of heteronormativity that operates on what I think are rather bleak stereotypes for both men and women. In other words, it's the church's attempt to use scientific language to arrive at doctrinal conclusions. Investigating the basic logic of complementarianism quickly reveals a rather slippery slope. Women are meant by nature and by virtue of their gender, according to this theory, to be courted, to be nearly passive recipients of male attention, male genitalia, male seed, and men equally bleakly are made out to be aggressors, suitors, pursuing women and leading them just as Christ leads the church. This, according to the theory, is true for every man and every woman without exception. So the characteristics would go. And I'll say that as an aside, most of these stereotypical attributes are not bad in themselves. It's not bad to be meek or passive, and it's not bad to be assertive or strong, but it seems to me without a doubt bad to essentialize these attributes as particular to one gender or another. It diminishes men and women, not to mention leaving trans and non-binary people out of the conversation entirely, because it insists that a person's gender as it's assigned at birth has certain personality traits absolutely essential to it. So what then is a strong man, uh, a strong woman, a gay man, a non-binary person, or heaven forbid, a person who is sometimes meek and sometimes strong to do in this system? When character traits are biologically ordained, the variety of our humanity suffers. So that's the second thing I'd say I heard when I was listening to the church talk about gender. I heard flat portraits of femininity <clears throat> and masculinity embellished with scientific jargon and theological trappings as if those things could distract from this utter lack of nuance. I'll say that I think this utter lack of nuance is not just disingenuous, but dangerous. I think the way these theological stereotypes do harm to women are probably rather obvious to many people listening. We know that women experience sexual harassment and harm, domestic violence, economic violence, pay gaps, and more because of the way patriarchal beliefs like those embedded in our institutions, including our church, operate. But they do harm to trans and non-binary people who are largely ignored when the church talks about gender, but who experience higher rates of violence than any other demographic, despite making up such a small portion of the population. And these stereotypes do harm to men too who, when cast as the aggressor for so long, will begin to believe it. Since 1982, men have been responsible for 153 mass murders. Women have been responsible for four. And this violence turns on itself. Men are nearly four times more likely to die by suicide than women. This is concerning to me. And I think all parties, all genders are impacted by stereotypes that are insufficient. In a piece this summer that, Was that Washington Post writer Christine Ember wrote, she investigates this problem of modern masculinity, writing that, quote, past models of masculinity feel unreachable or socially unacceptable, but new ones have yet to crystallize. Where are men? What are men for the modern world? What do they look like? Where do they fit? These are social questions, but also ones with major political ramification. Whatever self-definition men settle on will have an enormous impact on society, end quote. 
So when we hear the church talk about gender, it matters because the narratives that men, women, trans, and non-binary people hear about themselves impact how all of these people move through the world and what they believe about themselves. Before joining Commonweal, I worked as the head writer at Springtide Research Institute, where we studied trends in religious and spiritual seeking among young people. And so I can say with some confidence, and to Nancy's point in her introduction, that there is a crisis of trust among young people toward traditional institutions like the church. And that that lack of trust is often related to a failure of institutions to extend justice to its constituents, basic justice. And in the case of your generation, the generation who pop, who makes up Nancy's class and hopefully some other folks who are here listening in, gender and racial equity are in particular deal breakers. That is, if young people don't see institutions like churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, but also like banks, for-profit companies, governments, and hospitals, doing the bare minimum in terms of equality, they simply won't engage those organizations. And I'll say that I think this lack of engagement may very well be justified. It can be hard to save what appears to be a sinking ship. Often people have asked me why I stay on something that seems to be so flawed or to extend the metaphor so filled with water, so dead set on its ways that it won't reroute even after we've ostensibly hit an iceberg. And I remember being asked this as a young woman, why did I care to be part of a, per a church that wouldn't make room for me? And I remember asking it, why should I care? And why should I stay? At various times in my life, I've answered this question differently. But I can tell you at least one of the answers now as it pertains to this larger conversation about how the church talks about gender. I wonder, I worry, really, about who will get to define the conversations around gender in the church if those of us dissatisfied with the current terms decide to give up on the ship altogether. In Emba's piece from the Washington Post, she poses questions about who will step in to offer men a framework for whatever positive masculinity might be as men undergo a kind of cultural identity crisis. She notes that, quote, many people hesitate to be the one to try to outline a new standard of manliness. But she goes on to observe, only one group seems to have no doubts about offering men a plan. And that group is the alt-right. For a long time as a young woman in the Catholic church, I listened for how the church talked about women and femininity. I listened to hear myself described, acknowledged, and defined. I still listen for those things, but now my listening has another quality to it. I'm a mother of two small boys, and I wonder constantly how they will na navigate their maleness. What narratives will they be offered about what it means to be male? What stereotypes will they be expected to fulfill or buck? What tools can the church give them to be whole, healthy human persons? And will it be successful in offering those tools, those insights, and those truths to future generations? This is what I hear when I hear the church talking about gender. Thank you very much, Ellen. That is that is really, really helpful. And just, you know, like you, sometimes I am meek and sometimes I am strong. And uh, I'm really glad that you contributed that. We now turn to the voice of Molly Wilson O'Reilly. Molly is a contributor at Commonweal Magazine. She is also editor at large, and I read her every time she comes out. Molly. Thank you, Nancy. Um, yes, so I have been uh, involved with Commonweal for uh, a long time now, since uh, 2008 or so. Um, and uh, I have written a lot about this question um, over the years, as well as, as editing and, and seeking out other commentary. Um, I am a cradle Catholic, and I am the mother of four boys. And uh, back in 1994, I was the first female altar server in my parish in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, and I go back to that formative experience, and it was very formative for me in, in my faith um, to get to do that ministry. But I go back to that when I think about the church and gender, because that was my first uh, conscious encounter with the question of how my body, which as far as the church is concerned, is the same thing as my gender, uh, determines how and whether I can participate in the liturgy, the prayer of the church. So when I hear the church talk about gender, and 
Um, I should clarify, I guess, that in this case, when I say the church, what I mean is the leadership, so the you know, exclusively male hierarchy. Um, I hear a kind of doublespeak because uh, on the one hand, the church affirms that men and women are equally made in the image of God, equal in dignity, uh, both called to full and active participation in the church's life and ministry. But on the other hand, the church insists that the priesthood uh, and therefore its leadership in every almost every meaningful sense uh, remains open to men alone and that other types of discrimination against women are permitted and protected within the church if they can be seen to contribute to the health and maintenance of this all male priesthood. So I'm going to explain a little bit what I mean by that in talking about altar girls. But I started researching and writing about the question of altar servers because looking back uh, when I was at Commonweal 15 years later, 15 years after it had been first permitted in my parish, uh, I wanted to learn more about what had changed in 1994 and what hadn't changed. Um, because to me, it was clearly a very happy anniversary to say, oh, for 15 years now, this has been a place where the church stopped saying, you can't do this and started saying, yes, you can do this too. But I came to learn that at that time and still now today, altar girls was not a settled question and was still somehow a controversial thing. Uh, I didn't find the celebration that I hoped to find. And I came to see the whole matter as a kind of microcosm of the way that the church engages in this sort of doublespeak around gender. So I'm gonna talk about that a little, but of course you can't talk about the contemporary church's attitudes about sex and gender or really about anything without talking about the Second Vatican Council. And so I want to give a brief, brief background in case any of you uh, don't know what we mean when we say Vatican II. Um, Second Vatican Council was a series of meetings of uh, all the bishops of the world that was convened by Pope John XXIII and ran from 1962 to 1965. And it was focused on bringing the church into a more fruitful conversation with the modern world. And so what came out of Vatican II revolutionized that relationship between the church and the world in a lot of ways, uh, and especially for our purposes now around liturgy, the work of the people, the way that Catholics pray. So you're probably familiar if you've uh, ever been to a Catholic mass or watched television with the way that uh, those changes came about, that, uh, for example, the altars in churches were brought all out from the wall so that the people could gather around them uh, as at a meal. And the priest would stand on the other side of the altar facing them now and recite the prayers not only in Latin, but also in the vernacular, in the language that the people shared. Vatican II called for full and active participation from lay people, uh, that is to say the people who are not ordained in the church. And so in 1970, the Congregation for the Divine Worship issued guidelines to uh, help guide those liturgical reforms. They said, for example, that lay men and women on non-ordained people could read from the scriptures at mass. But they also specified that women could not serve the priest at the altar, not even in a setting like a convent where there were no other men besides the priest present. There would be no altar server, but there could not be a female altar server. And that was reiterated in 1980. So what changed? Canon law was updated in 1983. Uh, and in canon law, the provision that had to do with the role of altar server uh, seemed now to classify that job as a lay ministry along with lector and usher and things like that. And so there were people who saw that and said, well, that would mean that women and girls can do this job now and proceeded accordingly. Uh, and so there was a period of some controversy that some of you may remember between 1983 and 1994. Uh, when some people went ahead and uh, ha invited women and girls to serve at the altar and other people said, well, Rome hasn't said they changed their mind. So the question was put to the Congregation for the, the Divine Worship and they reached a decision in 1991, according to their records, I learned, but they didn't publish that decision until 1994. So at that time, they sent a letter to bishops and it confirmed that that interpretation of canon law that it permitted female altar service was correct. Uh, but in spite of that, the bulk of this letter was dedicated to preserving the right of bishops to exclude girls and women uh, because altar boys had traditionally been seen as potential candidates for the priesthood and because the priesthood remained open to men only. So even after 1994, 
a girl who wanted to be an altar server could be turned away on orders from her bishop. And later in 2001, the Congregation for Divine Worship clarified that even in a diocese where bishops had decided to permit altar girls, which by then was all but I think two dioceses in the United States, priests retained the right to exclude women from serving at the altar. So a priest whose bishop decided to exclude female altar servers couldn't say, well, they're welcome in my parish, that wasn't allowed. But a priest, any priest could say, no girls can serve in my parish and Rome would back him up. So what strikes me when I look back at those Vatican documents and the conversation around them and the conversation that didn't happen around them is the lack of concern for the well-being of the women and girls that they affect. There was a lack of interest in our perspective. Um, you will never find an apology for leaving women waiting so long. Uh, there's no celebration to the new openness to women that they heralded, uh, no acknowledgement that excluding women has a cost for those women and for the church in general. They are fundamentally documents that are written by men and addressed to other men, grudgingly admitting that technically men can allow women to participate as long as it's clear that they don't need to. So it was somewhat dispiriting for me to discover this because I had experienced being an altar server as something that uh, brought me closer to my faith and closer to the mass and helped me develop a love of the liturgy that I still have. But here, it seems to me, is another kind of doublespeak from the church because Pope John Paul II, who of course was the Pope in 1994, and who insisted on the necessity of maintaining the exclusively male priesthood during his papacy, spent a lot of energy developing the theory of gender complementarity that Ellen mentioned. Um, I think Ellen described it really well, but uh, the basic idea, right, is that women and men have different gifts and strengths and roles by virtue of their gender, and that they need each other to be complete. And yet, the celibate male-only leadership of the church never really seemed to worry that it might be missing something important in excluding women from its deliberations or from roles like serving at the altar. And that in talking about women without listening to women first, they might not be getting the whole picture. So what do I hear when the church talks about gender? Well, very seldom do I hear an acknowledgement that sexism ever played a role in shaping the church that we have now. I hear a reluctance to ever say we were wrong and an inability to acknowledge that we may have more to learn about gender, about sexuality, about the human experience in general. The conversation that I hear is dominated by the paralyzing fear of looking directly at our church's participation in the continued oppression of women, the marginalization of gay and lesbian and queer people, and the outright refusal to acknowledge the existence of trans and non-binary people. It's a fear that says, what happens to us if we stray from God's design? But also, and I think perhaps more honestly, it's a fear that says, what happens to us if we let go of our power? What happens if we admit that we have more to learn? The church has never been great at admitting when it has something to learn, not even after it finally does learn and respond. Uh, there's an old joke that says that when the Vatican finally allows women to be priests, the announcement will begin with the words, as the church has always taught. And maybe it should, because there are core teachings and essential truths that the church can, and I hope will, appeal to when it allows for women's participation at every level of ministry or when it retracts its damaging teachings about LGBTQ people. So researching this topic can be a little depressing for me, but in preparing for this discussion, I spent some time digging into scholarship around gender and sexuality in the church, much of it by women. And that reminded me that the church speaks with other voices too, outside the hierarchy, outside official Vatican documents. There are many scholars and believers who are already doing the hard work of breaking past the sexist framing to the truth of women and men's equal dignity and starting out from there to see what we might still have to learn. It's all too possible to be a practicing Catholic and never hear those voices, or at least never have to listen to them, but they are the best part of what I hear of the church's conversation around gender. And so I hope that this seminar series can elevate and continue that vital and honest conversation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Molly. That, 
Uh, I just, I really appreciate hearing from both of you. I have a few follow-up questions and then we'll turn to our audience who is, yes, who is, who is generating questions. Please feel free to touch the top of your screen to get the Q&A pop-up screen, or maybe maybe you see it in the bottom left of your screen. Um, but first, uh, Ellen, you pointed out so well that young people today, and I know you have a lot of experience with this from your time at Springtide, that young people today are suspicious of institutions across the board, not just the church. Yes. Why, why is there anything in particular about the church church that is putting them off that would not be true of other institutions or is this a more generalized suspicion um it is a more generalized suspicion um but there are certainly hallmarks of the reasons for suspicion around religious organization that aren't true or necessarily true in things like hospitals and banks um institutions by and large have sort of lost the trust of this younger generation who um you know, see in the news regularly um, betrayals, um, abuses, scandals, you know, um, crimes, and all of many of them perpetrated by people in power and then covered up by people in power. So they're inheriting traditions um, where certain generations, three or four generations ago, there was the utmost trust in certain institutions as um, pillars of society that if you gave to them, they would give back. And something as simple as social security is a great way of understanding that like those same stable pillars of society are no longer intact. And so um, that's that it is happening universally. But specifically what's going around going on around religious organizations is um, what Springtide called a sort of unbundled relationship to faith. And so I think this is a really interesting concept. It's this idea of thinking that um, rather than taking, you know, calling oneself a Catholic and taking the whole package of what it means to be Catholic all at face value, the identity, the beliefs, the community engagement, the rituals, young people will pick and choose. You know, in the 90s, we called it cafeteria Catholicism, but this is a sort of advanced version of that where it's a very thoughtful and intentional desire to take what is life giving from a variety of spiritual spaces as a seeker and to deny what is not life-giving. So a friend who sees that their gay peer is not welcome in the church will take what they can from the church and then leave behind what doesn't feel good, what is not life-giving. Um, so there's a sort of confrontation of that hypocrisy, an unwillingness to um, tolerate that hypocrisy. And instead they'll say, I'll, I'll take what good you can give me and then I'm happy to leave the rest behind. Oh, that, that's really that's really helpful. And it's a helpful contrast with that cafeteria Catholicism label that was uh, thrown about for so long. This is actually different, the unbundling that you're talking about. It's, you know, it's a, a, we no longer have uh, three channels on television. We have streaming services. It's totally unbundled. People yeah. are not identifying with, uh, younger people are not identifying with political parties. They identify with issues. Would it be similar yeah. to that, do you think? Exactly. You. That's exactly right. And it, and it is different than, you know, the cafeteria Catholicism, especially insofar as we think about it as a, a serious and thoughtful discernment rather than simply an opting out. Like that it, it is coming from a place of discernment and value judgment rather than um, I don't feel like getting up at 9 a.m. on Sundays. Like it isn't laziness, it's thoughtfulness that, that propels them. That's helpful to know. You know, you said something that just really struck me. You were talking about the alt-right and you were talking about the rise of suicide among men. And you just, you said the violence turns on itself. And um, I wondered if you wanted to unpack anything about that. I think, um, I think that when men are not given narratives that support them as whole healthy humans, and they're cast in roles that are made that make them out to be powerful, then then feeling weak becomes a problem. Um, when they're supposed to be um, stoic, then being emotional becomes a problem. And um, when they're disappointed or when society tells them that they have everything at their fingertips and they're, they are the recipients of utter privilege, but they feel at a loss or, you know, weak or, you know, jobless, homeless, um, struggling with mental health, but the, the overarching social narrative about their position in life is about their privilege. Those become so um, 
the tensions I think become so serious and so in, difficult to unpack um, that, uh, and 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 there's so few communities that will unpack those things for them. And so um, I speak with experience from this. My own brother died by suicide. It, you know, it wasn't exactly related to these these particular tensions, but I do think that part of it is the difficulty for men to get access to the mental health um, uh, resources that they need. Um, but I also think that in a time of total instability, what feels like a time of real cultural flux that we're in right now, um, people are looking for stability and certainty. And um, the alt-right and, and folks like Jordan Peterson and others are happy to provide very clear traditional roles and identities that reinforce a kind of masculinity that is not self-reflective, is not emotional is you know is not is the is the old thing it used to be um because that's safer than the instability of what the kind of liberal message is these days about toxic masculinity so um yeah that's that's how i i, I begin to think about some of the tensions and dynamics at work in that and it's you know it's heartbreaking it is heartbreaking to to hear that there's a way in which we, you know, as a society, we have a loss of imagination about mm. what masculinity could look like, the many faces that could be uh, put forward there. And instead, we seem to have a few cartoons. And if you don't fit into one of those yeah. cartoons, uh, it's equally destructive for men as it is for women. And I'm I'm sorry to hear that. Um, you know, turning to you, Molly, uh, I, I'll tell you, when they first started with Altar Girls, uh, I remember reading... Uh, and in fact, someone in the chat here said, oh, no, I knew someone who was an altar girl in the 1980s. So there might have been some very progressive parishes out there. Um, I, The conservative uh, people who were writing against altar girls argued that even though this is not, this is a lay person's office, this is not a step on the way to priesthood, that just doing this would confuse those girls and would make them think mm -hmm. that they had business being on that altar and so that and here's the thing i think conservatives are often right about symbolic issues um i don't i don't agree with them but is it true it seems to me to be true that symbols do function mm -hmm. and those altar girls that comfort with the machinery of ritual that comfort with walking into the sacristy as someone who has a, a job to do uh that sort of the demystification and the welcome that was greeting many altar girls as they took this task up, learned how to do it, felt themselves useful there. I think that that could have an effect. And I think conservatives were right to, to fear that um, because they knew that, in fact, symbols matter. Any sense of that? Yeah, I mean, you're definitely right. When I when I was writing about it, I, I did a lot of um, looking up because the the congregation for the divine worship had said that if a bishop wanted to permit it in his diocese, if he ha felt he had a good reason, he would need to explain that reason carefully so that people wouldn't be confused, um, which struck me as funny and still strikes me as funny because it that wasn't what people found confusing in my experience. It was the idea that still in 1983 or in 1994, um, we were still saying no. Um, it was certainly confusing to me as a little girl that you know my older brothers could do this, but my older sister couldn't, or that you know my classmates when we were in third grade that they came to our class and said, "Who wants to be an altar server?" But only the boys, and you know they they weren't any better than me. That didn't make sense to me. Um, so. Uh, I think I think it's yes the idea that um, allowing girls to do this job would uh, give them ideas about what their proper role might be in the church um, was correct. I think it was labeling that as confusion. That's the tendentious part because I don't think anybody was confused about whether. Uh, girls seemed to belong there, whether it seemed natural that girls were there, it was instead leading them to question, well, what about these other arbitrary uh, limitations and do they make sense? I mean, before uh, there, I'm sure there are people watching who remember this, but before the Second Vatican Council, 
women weren't allowed in the sanctuary at all. You know, the, the part of the church that's, uh, if you go to an you know, older church, there's a communion rail, the part behind the communion rail. And when they first said that women could read at mass in 1970, there's a line in that document that says that the conferences of bishops will have to determine an appropriate place for the women to read from. And when I read that in you know 2000 and whatever, I, I, it seems so strange and I had to, to, it doesn't explain in words because we still wanna keep them out of the sanctuary if we can. Um, so I had to sort of figure that out for myself, but of course that, that was what it was because again, it was this idea that we have this taboo that's not necessary and not a teaching, but we still feel like if we break it, we're going to lose something that we can't get back. Hmm. Right. What about what? So two arguments here. One is the opening that came with the Second Vatican Council that, for example, in its documents recognized that uh, women work and wasn't wasn't condemnatory of that. They simply recognized that women were working. Uh, and that women held a number of jobs and that this was fine, seems to be a different tone than that that emerged during the pontificate of John Paul II that suddenly and very explicitly was articulating a particular sort of psychosexual gestalt for female persons that would issue then in a number of norms. And that that act, it, it's helpful for when I talk to my students, they they think that sort of the progress or the or the backsliding in the church kind of all went one way. But in fact, we have kind of circled way back around in terms of questions of gender in ways that have really surprised me. Um, do you have anything to say about that, Molly? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I think that in our society, we tend to tell a story of uh, forever making progress forward. That is um, a little too simplistic, but um, we are at least willing to say, you know, it, it, it's better now than it was before. We were unenlightened before and we're doing better now whenever we make some kind of progress in any kind of civil rights, human rights. Um, and in the church, we can't even do that because like I said, the, the church has no mechanism for saying, well, we were wrong before. So even when it makes changes, it doesn't ever acknowledge that it's making a change. Um, and I definitely think that that's part of why we're so stuck when it comes to women's roles and why it's possible to backslide. If you're a, a Pope who wants to articulate a justification that you think will sound better to contemporary ears, because it doesn't just flat out say women are not as uh, intelligent as men or as responsible as men or as important as men, as the church did sometimes say before the Second Vatican Council. You can't say that anymore, but you do still want to arrive at the same conclusion, um, which is that women are not made for the most important jobs in this church or maybe in the world. Um, I don't remember the beginning of this sentence. Oh, well, the, the church lets you do that, I guess is what I'm trying to say, because it's it's not in the process of saying we don't, maybe Pope so-and-so said this, but that's embarrassing to us now and we don't say it anymore. They just sort of quietly stop saying it. And so then some future Pope could go back to it and say, actually, I liked that. Right. We do have a tendency to sort of homogenize tradition. I think that's really true. No, I have... Uh... The, the chat has, the questions are, have exploded here. So if if you will, please. I'm gonna follow up on that one, Molly, with something from uh, Katie Wright. Um, hello, this is Catherine Wright from Dr. Dallavelli's class. Why would people or religious leaders be reluctant to allow women to be ordained? What differences do men and women hold in their contribution to Christianity and to the church in the priesthood? What are the positives and negatives of having women have a larger role? I, I offer this to either of you. Would you like, Ellen, you're smiling. Would you like to bounce in there and then? Yeah. Uh, it's a great question. What I'm, I'm reading it again for myself since I have the luxury of it being in the chat here. Um, why would they be reluctant? I, it, I'm, I laughed because it's like, why would they be reluctant? <laughs> that's, that's how I'm like actually feeling the question. Um, I think there's, um, why would they be reluctant? Um, it's largely what Molly has said um, really well, which is that there's fear around, um, you know, a shuffling of power dynamics, I think. Um, but also, like, if I were to give them the best possible, uh, give the best possible response to this, um, the church moves slow because it does not operate 
in the same way that secular culture operates. And I think that can be a very good thing. I think sometimes, like Molly was saying, pro progress as good and forward moving is not always the case. Um, I, I can recall as a kind of aside, a conversation with my brother a long time ago talking about technology and how kids are so smart now they can pick, figure out all the buttons on the iPad. And I think I thought, you know, Homer had had, you know, a year's worth of poetry in his head memorized. Like what what is what's the better brain? I don't know. Like so the idea that progress is always good is an interesting question to me. Um, and so I think on the one hand, the church is wary of um appearing to move in, along the same track and at the same pace as cultural trends. And so where there's um feminist movements in culture, I think that almost makes the church want to press the brakes a little bit to say, well, we wouldn't want to appear to be doing something that's culturally ordained because we, or we're, you know, we're driven by a different order. Um, but I do think the question around gender, both how we define it and then what roles are given based on those definitions is this really long-term one. And I think probably some of this is coming up in um, Dr. Delavalli's class, um, but we have this really interesting history of men and women both having more fluid relationships to their sense of gender, even God in scripture having, you know, sometimes male and sometimes female language, uh, um, that there's there's the the church's language around this is so much co more capacious than we than the actual terms being used in current conversation that that it does strike me as mostly fear about the novelty rather than a sort of very um open-handed engagement with the fullness of our tradition and what's possible for us to think about when it comes to gender i think could be more expansive than what cult secular culture does but it would be in this really narrow way at the same time so um did i answer the question i don't know but i enjoyed the question very much <laughs> uh, first, first of all you answered it beautifully and what you pointed out i think is you know catholic means universal we are constantly trying to hold together the entirety of tradition, the entirety of human experience. Mm -hmm. And that that does mean that sometimes things don't move as fast as we want. And sometimes it means that we're able to retrieve things that make our story a lot bigger, a lot more interesting, a lot more yeah. complex. Yeah. Um, I have another question here uh, from um, Julian. And so um, Ellen, if you would just stay with me for a second. Ellen pointed out that the current crisis is part of young adults' perception that the church is not open enough. And that as an institution, it has not fully reached its goal of social justice. So the church under Pope Francis is accommodating LGBTQ plus Catholics. How does it maintain its values while becoming a more modern community? Mm -hmm. Ellen, you could answer that. Or Molly, would you like to jump in there? Is that of interest? Go ahead, Molly. <laughs> oh, I, I was waiting to see if Molly had interest, but yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, th I feel like I kind of got lost in the question. Um, <laughs> I was reading along again. I love the chat feature. Um, so, the idea oh, how does the church maintain its values and traditions while becoming a more modern community? Mm -hmm. um, I, I worry more about the church um, maintaining its existence without becoming a more modern community, um, I think. Um, I, I don't know. I think the people who uh, run the church, with the partial exception of Pope Francis, I would say, um, are very set on the idea that the church's identity is its limitations around things like LGBTQ people or the role of women, um, that those things are are not just elements of church teaching, but, but constitutive of the church in a way that um, they must be clung to regardless. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I feel like Pope Francis has come in in a way that is trying to undo that anxiety a little bit. Um, and that's really necessary. But I've been dismayed by how much pushback he's gotten or how much sort of non-cooperation he's gotten um, 
this these issues, especially issues around um, gay people, queer people, and their role, their participation in the church, feel to me um, very similar to the idea, the, the question about women as priests is why, why wouldn't we want to, if it's possible, and I think so many people have persuasively argued that it is possible to explore more openness, why wouldn't we want to do that? Um, so... Yeah. I, think, um, I don't have an answer though. I, Thank you. That's I, really helpful. Please. Don't. I like the idea. Um, I, I'm again borrowing from Molly, who uh, had all the all the right remarks, but I'm just stealing them for other reasons now. Um, <laughs> Uh, this uh, the church is not just the leadership of the church either and all along it has been the people of God and even there's precedent for the way the people of God um, impact doctrine this is there's there's real channels in the actual mechanisms of the church for the people of God to arrive at conclusions um, by virtue of their their prayer their experiences their revelations um and so first of all that I think is, there's a dynamic here where we're talking about a more liberal church. That church already exists. That is the church. As long as we don't leave, you know, the, the liberals among us, then that's that is the church. Um, and and so is the other one. They're just both the church, which is one of my favorite things about being Catholic is that um, it, there's just enough room for everybody. You know, Peter and Paul kicked it off by being in constant fights with each other. And that's kind of my expectation for the long term here is that we might keep elbowing each other a little bit to make more room. But importantly, I remember when I was in a theology class as an undergrad, um, recognizing that there are roles in the church. Some roles are to expand and some roles are to constrict. And they're actually both needed for us to arrive at the middle ground, which is the truth. And so we have the work of theologians and commonweal, if you don't mind, um, trying to expand um, and the classrooms trying to expand. And then we have magisterium, which is trying to say now to define what's been expanded, we need X, Y, Z. Those are the right terms. This is the right formula. These are the people who can do it and the people who can't. So there's this constant dance of expansion and constriction, but that's that's part of the model of the church itself. Um, and I think that's where we land um, on, you know, how, how the church develops um, and grows and becomes more modern, but it's actually a pretty ancient practice. Okay. I just, I encourage everyone uh, to look at the questions. We're not going to be able to ask all of these, but there is a great conversation going on in that question, answer, which is just so terrific, so terrific and so exciting to see. Uh, speaking of that push and pull, though, uh, so uh, several people have asked about this uh, recent docu document, Fiducia Supplicans, which uh, allows, pers uh, allows, really kind of allows clergy who before had been enjoined from uh, issuing blessings of some kinds to extend blessings. People are picking up mostly on the fact that clergy are allowed to bless same-sex persons who come to them asking for a blessing. Um, but when you talk about the church and the pushback to Pope Francis, this is an example of it. Um, there's, it certainly, it quickly becomes fairly politicized in the United States, but I think more importantly, it's a global church. And so openness to LGBTQ persons is not uniform through the church. Um, how are we to go forward? Are we going to end up in schism in the US or is there a value to keeping that, what I think of as horizontal Catholicity hmm. uh, holding us together? Even, even if it means that things might not go the way I would vote. I mean, yeah, I see Pope Francis being characterized a lot um, on the right or by conservatives as um, radical and reckless. And, um, you know, I, I wish is what I sometimes think because he's he's not that at all. Um, and reading this document, looking at this document um, was uh, from the, the uh, CDF uh, under his leadership. Um, is an example of that, I think, because it, it starts off with a very careful explanation of the process that led to it. And then it, you know, repeats church teaching and says, you know, to be clear, this is not challenging any of the church's teaching on marriage and all of that. 
Um, and then it gets into uh, a lot of, of reflecting, I think, um, much of which uh, we can assume comes from Francis himself about the meaning of blessing and how he would like to see the church use blessing. Um, I think he uh, specializes in this sort of uh, non-radical way of finding the places where the church can respond in different places, in different situations to uh, people's needs, in mercy and in generosity. And this, uh, in, if you read the document, is supposed to be interpreted as an example of that. Um, so if this kind of move leads to schism, it, it can only be because uh, of the reactionary impulses of the people who don't want to see the church become more generous or more open, even in the ways that you know, the CDF is explaining are available to it right now. I just, you know, I just want, we should all write down, Molly, you know, that about Pope Francis finding ways for the church to respond with mercy and generosity. He has done that over and over again. Having said that, uh, LGBTQ persons have read this and said, you know, it's kind of half a loaf. Mm -hmm. followed it up with a document that said so very carefully, oh, we're not blessing the union, we're just blessing the persons, mm -hmm. um, right. which feels like kind of half an acceptance for many, I think. And yet it still is in a document that many would say is way too, is so merciful and generous that it fails to teach the truth. Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we think about, I mean, it, it really does, it does end up creating quite a conundrum. This pope is very uh, dedicated, I think, to the idea that the the development of doctrine, so to speak, needs to come, uh, like Ellen was saying, from the process uh, traditional in the church, where it it uh, it comes up from the ground and you know gets gets established slowly, not by fiat from the top. Um, so I can imagine, and maybe I'm making things up about the changes that Pope Francis might like to make if he wanted to, you know, rule as a tyrant which is ironically the thing that his opponents on the right are always insisting that he's actually doing. Um, and I think he's really working to lay groundwork for the church to be a church that can make changes when they're necessary and can say, we got that wrong and we need to rethink it. And that's what the, the synod and all of that is all about. But in the meantime, yes, we get these sort of half measures that, that indicate a certain kind of openness um, but also, you know, are very clear about what they're not. And all of that leads to very, it's, a, it's always been a challenge, I think, for the general public and the general news media to try to translate. Something happened in Rome, but it, it, but it wasn't everything that you think might have happened, but it was, <laughs> so I sympathize with anybody who has to try to communicate what this means and what it doesn't mean, because I think it, there's a lot of both. But, but I think you, you are, putting your finger very much on how change happens in the church. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't just finally produce the document and they say, ah, now we get it. Okay, we're changing everything. There's gonna be a push pull all along. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to a question here from my friend, Diana McElintel, who says, I'm interested in the panel's insight on how gender roles in the church might be approached differently in communities of color. Beyond the imbalances of power, there seems to be other layers of concern among women of color that aren't always expressed in discussions that are less diverse in their voices. What would you What would you say to that? I think there's probably a, I, I think she's probably right. These these conversations go differently. The the presenting issues, the things that just really kind of stick in your craw, might look differently in communities of color. Any sense of that? I think that's a hundred percent true. Um, and I can't speak from experience, but I can speak by quoting some of the really wise people I have read on the subject um, that I think very often um, the movements that white women tend to champion are those that imitate the power structures that white men already have. And so um, in the church, I think very often uh, there are um, dynamics wherein, you know, white women, women, you know, and ostensibly sort of the women's movements or something like that in the church are predicated on terms that uh, 
primarily want to imitate the power structures or the positions of privilege or the the authorities um, that they already see men have. And when we do that, um, and this happens, I think, in secular feminism too, um, we uh, often end up leaving behind a kind of femininity, a role for women that now needs to be replaced, and then it gets replaced by women of color. Um, so there's this book by um, uh, Rebecca Rebecca Trist, Trist, something like that, um, talking about when women, you know, moved into the workforce, like who stayed home with their kids. It was women of color, because when we talk about women moving into the workforce, it was white women. That that's who moved into the, the workforce, and um, so I think we have to be very cautious about assuming that the thing women want in the church is the thing all women want instead of it's the thing white women want. Um, and so by and large, I would say there's a, a tendency for feminism to be cast as a kind of white feminism, which is you know a term of art these days. Um, but I would advocate great caution around presuming that what women want in terms of roles identifiers, affiliations in the context of the church is universal instead of distinct from, you know, a variety of perspectives, race being one of them. So that homogeny around gender itself, I think, is uh, a temptation, but one we should avoid. And engage, the thing is, engaging constructively across color lines, engaging directly with the racism that is experienced by persons of color in the church is not something we need to change any doctrine to do. That's about hearts and minds. And that's about the that's about the US church. Mm. And that's that certainly is something that can't be sort of sectioned off from these concerns about gender. These are all they all impact one another. And in fact, they shape one another, as we well know. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So I have a couple of things I'd like to just lift up from the chat. Um, uh, someone once, someone said here, in my observation, women have always been welcome in the sanctuary, provided they are equipped with a head rag, mop, and dust cloth. Oh, <laughs> I think my my first experience of being very comfortable in a sanctuary was as a fourth grader cleaning the church on Fridays. I could go anywhere I wanted as long as I made it clean when I was there. <laughs> um, uh, I have an, I have another one uh, up here. Let me just find this here. Um, uh, someone said that they seem to recall that our conscience is supposed to be our guide from the catechism. Uh, I believe they are right about that. Um, how do we think about the church when we when we think these very contested questions should also be questions of conscience? They're not just of social policy, but they're about sort of individual persons asking, who should I be standing before God? And along with that, I would mention that someone else in the chat said, are you going to talk at all about this women priest movement in the Roman Catholic Church? Would either of you like to address any of those? Well, I can about the conscience question. Um, yes, and the the uh, the catechism has a beautiful passage about how um, you know a, a person being alone with their conscience before God. Um, but of course, it also talks about a properly formed conscience, and that's that's what people will say back to you if you say, "Well, what about my conscience?" Um, and the the kind of formation that the church officially says is correct around gender roles is, I think, very cramped. Um, so it, it makes it very difficult to have a dialogue because on the one side, it's, well, if your conscience says something different than what this says, then your conscience is simply not properly formed. Okay, fair, fair enough, fair enough. One last question here. I see our time is going. Any hopes for the synod that will uh, reconvene in October? What, what might women expect from that? What would be realistic? What would be a satisfactory outcome? Uh, what do you hope is at least heard in that forum? Uh, Ellen, I'll ask you to start. I'll ask you to finish, Molly. I think um, I, I feel hope about the Synod and, um, and my hope is that uh, I don't have any expectations for immediate fruit to be honest and rather frank. Um, but that there will be um, groundwork laid that make that make invitations to women a, a regular feature of gatherings at the Vatican, and that will make women's voices and participation more readily heard, and that those will 
take effect in in the life of the church over time. Um, so I'm very hopeful about it, and I think um, will it will bear fruit for for you know decades, or maybe a century or more to come, um, if these things can be implemented in ways that feel sustainable and not sort of reactive. Thank you, uh, uh, Molly. So when it comes to um, talking about the all male priesthood, which I feel like I always end up doing, um, people say, well. The, the problem is that all of the power and all of the authority in the church is limited to the male priesthood. So if you're saying that only men can be priests because they can only stand in persona Christi and all of that, well, then you have to develop another way for women to have some kind of authority and, and uh, power in the church. Um, and Pope Francis was the first pope that I ever saw say that himself, that we need to, as a matter of, of justice, we need to create places for women to be present when decisions are being made, when important things are being discussed. Um, I would have liked to have seen him do that more radically, but I, the Synod, it was an example of a place where he began the process of doing that in a concrete way. Um, so if only that, that gives me some hope, that kind of model, if it can be maintained and expanded on for uh, an increase in justice in the church um, on matters of gender. Thank you so much. On that fairly hopeful note, which I think we do all share, uh, I will say thank you to our audience tonight. Our next uh, episode in this three uh, event series will be on March 13th at five o'clock. You can sign up for that, register so that you're part of the conversation at uh, fairfield.edu slash CS. I want to thank our friends Molly Wilson O'Reilly and Ellen Connick from Commonweal Magazine for joining with Fairfield University on this new venture. So thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night.